Welcome to the Femininja Project. I am your host, Cheryl Ilove, middle-aged ninja hiding in plain sight, dedicated to restoring human dignity one person at a time and helping you unleash your personal power. Discover that it's possible to look like a woman, act like a lady, move like a ninja, and think like a warrior. And remember, men are always welcome on the Femininja Project. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Femininja Project. And thank you so much for tuning in. And as you know by now, we at the show are all about overcoming obstacles and thriving in spite of the challenges that life throws at us. After all, life is full of hits and none of us get through it without our share. And today's guest knows a lot about overcoming hardships. He's a fantastic man. I just love him. His name is C.L. King, and he is the owner of C.L. King Group Incorporated. And I recently had not only the distinct honor of meeting him, but the honor of being a guest on his podcast, Impacting Life 24-7. Besides being a podcast host, C.L. is a motivational speaker with his primary goal on impacting one life, one day at a time. He is also the director of a youth advocacy organization, a former Marine, and the super proud father of seven children. CL, welcome to the show. Well, you know, this is truly a distinct honor of mine. You know, there are times in life where you connect with someone and you connect with them in a, in a different way. And uh, many times, you know, you meet someone and it's in passing, it's for that season. But uh, Cheryl, I'm so delighted that God put us together because I feel like uh, this is going to be one of many collaborations we'll do throughout the future. Absolutely. I just love talking to you and As I said, I was honored to be on your show and for, wow, so motivational. I was so pumped up for the entire week. I mean, I was like, yes, I can do so much. And I just wanted to take on the world. And it was just such a joy to talk to you. Your energy and your spirit is just incredible. But what makes you even more fascinating and more interesting and more impressive is that you started out kind of rough in life. You didn't have it very easy. No. And, you know, the the one thing that I have learned in this journey is that oftentimes we appreciate the end state of a thing. You go to Mount Rushmore and you appreciate the magnificent magnitude of that powerful edifice, but you don't realize the the beginning state that uh, that took place. And Mount Rushmore happened right in the middle of the Great Depression. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people just come and they appreciate it, but they don't understand the 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 work and the dynamic trauma that it took to bring it to pass. And so I am very appreciative of the whole body of work that the Lord has allowed me to go through, Cheryl. Um, it, it, you know, the same thing with your journey, maybe it wasn't, you know, similar to mine in the fact that you, I was in the streets of Cleveland, but mm-hmm. we all have been forged in the crucible and the grind of life. And mm-hmm. so my, my life was, was very dramatic when it began. And, uh, I'd be happy to share some of that with your listeners whenever you want me to. How about now? <laughs> I love this free flow style, man. This is it right here, baby. I might change my style on my show to do it just like, just like this. So listen, back in uh, some time, back before there were color TVs, I was born in the city of Cleveland, Ohio. And my life was was forged in adversity. I remember when uh, I don't remember, but I was told that I was taken away from my mother at a very young age, I believe Mm -hmm. three years old and placed into foster care at a tender age of three. The reason why is because some paraphernalia was left in a vehicle, some alcohol. And as a curious three year old, I got a hold of it. And it sent my body into a shock, uh, was unconscious, had to be resuscitated, and thus 
taking away from my mother and put into the social services system at the tender age of three years old. I do remember moving around a bit. I, I don't know if there were more foster homes in play to where my memory starts getting a little clearer in focus. I do recall that there was a time period where I lived with my grandmother mm -hmm. and that could be, you know, let's say from five, six, seven years old. And I, I have fond memories of my grandmother, but there was just a different dispensation that I was caught in because my dad, who was a, a preacher, beat the living fire out of me. Now, when I talk oh. about beat, I ain't talking about, you know, you, you, you got to give your kid a spanking if that's what you choose to do. I'm talking about punching me like an adult. Oh. And I'll, nev I'll never forget the ringing in my ear getting open hand slapped, getting punched in the face. Um, and, and it seemed like this bled over into the way later on my grandmother was responding to me because they would do things crazy, like put me out in the garage with the dogs. Now the oh. garage was detached. In the winter time, that's not a very hospitable place to be in the middle of winter. And I remember sitting out there from sunset to sunrise as, a, as a, I wasn't even 11 years old. And why, I would think to myself, why is this happening to me? Why did my name be, as I recall from my father, Dumb MF? Oh. That was the name I recall so often. I've, I oftentimes wondered, was, was that my actual name? And, and, and those tragedies, they get embossed in your brain, ladies and gentlemen. Let me tell you something. As a father of seven children, I, I speak to parents, too, that, man, we all are working to navigate through parenthood. But, man, your kids remember this stuff. It's forged in their mind. And so around the age of 10, I went to live with my mother. I don't know how all that worked out, but I went to live with her because what was going on with my father and my grandmother was pretty radical. It was, it, you, this guy was supposed to be a preacher and oh. beating me. I was his only kid. He was beating me like I, I, I was a boxer. So I went to stay with my mother in Cleveland, Ohio. And I thought I was going to a, an upgrade in circumstances. And in reality, it was, it was even more traumatic than living in a garage with my dogs oh. at my grandmother's house. My, we had so many different dynamics. I can just tell you one. I remember the time my sister and I <clears throat> had to clean up the cockroaches, right? Now, they, they let off bombs in the apartment, but this wasn't just an ordinary cleanup of cockroaches. I re vividly remember, and my sister can verify this, sweeping up and filling up black trash bags full of cockroaches. Oh, my word. Oh. We we went from soup kitchens to uh, homeless shelters. The electricity was on again, off again. I remember, uh, Cheryl, kids passing food through the fence at this apartment we were at. I remember kids balling up and gumming up bread and passing it through the fence to me because I was a severely malnutritioned kid because it was just there was no food. And so uh, situations turned for the worst. Uh, I don't remember the date, but her husband uh, had brought home a brownie from a soup kitchen and he left it for my mother. Well, we were so hungry, Cheryl. My sister and I were so hungry. I, I vividly, I vividly remember that. Mm. And uh, I snuck into the kitchen and took a little corner off of that brownie mm. and reformed it back. So it would look like nothing had happened. Mm. Then I went back and took another corner and took another until there was nothing left. And my mother woke up that next day and said, who took my brownie? Well, my sister who I dearly love, she's older than me. She would not tell that it was me. My mother says, I'm going to beat y'all every day till someone tells who took this brownie. Well, let me tell you something. I had about had my fill of getting beat yeah. with this. Are you familiar with any kind of auto mechanics? Not really. <laughs> well, a fan <laughs> belt on your car. Oh, yeah. Is, okay. Got that. Kind of a tough material, right? Right. That's the, that whoever fabricated this belt for my mother, that's what that material was made out of. It was thick. And it, I have scars on my body to this day at 45 years old 
from getting whoopings with that device right there. Oh, God. And the psychological impact of getting yet another whooping was too much for me because here's the deal. We had been exposed to so many harsh dynamics that kids should never be exposed to. I'm talking about sexual molestation and Mm. family molestation that was grievous. And I'm sitting here thinking, well, man, I just had to stay in the garage and get punched by Mike Tyson, my dad. But this is over the top. I'm talking about exposure to drugs, us running drugs from it was an absolute nightmare. Well, I told that night, I remember telling my sister, I will not get beat again. I, this 11 year old kid Mm -hmm. will not get beat with that thing one more time. Cause it would rip your flesh off. It was, it was, it was a barbaric form of discipline. And um, I left out the front door that next morning, Cheryl, I walked out the front door and I left the front door open. My baby sister was just an infant and Melinda was several years older than me if I was 11. Mm -hmm. And I walked out the front door and I never went back. Not one time. Now I stayed on the streets from there because I knew the streets. 11 year old kid was savvy on the streets, where to go for, where to go for food, where to go for shelter. Sometimes I'd sleep on, uh, you know, on benches or in, in clefts of bridges and watch the sun go down. I'd walk the streets watching the sun go down and coming back up. This is happening at 11, but guess what I did, Cheryl? I still played the part. I went to school and the teachers knew something was up because I was always getting double breakfasts and double lunches because I was so malnutrition. When I talk about malnutrition, I was, uh, you could see my ribs. I vividly remember. And my sister who may see this broadcast one day can verify everything that I'm saying. Right. And so after six months of living this life, this masked life of trying to keep myself sustained as an 11 year old kid, I finally confessed to my teachers that I wasn't living at home and they, they uh, got social services involved. And I was put in the first group home. It was called the Better Way Group Homes in Elyria, Ohio. And here I am thinking, Cheryl, that I got another step up, right? Um, from from, from getting wow. beat by your dad, living in a g- garage sometimes, to going in and being watching and being engaged in molestation from people that are supposed to be taking care of you, to now going to this place where it's a staff and you got seven or eight other guys. And I was the youngest kid there, maybe 12 years old. And the exact same thing under the radar happened to me there in this group home, uh, being violated as a young kid with all these kids from the hood that was 16, 17 years old. And oh. here's this young, you can just imagine, okay? Because I know you have a family show, but you can just imagine, let your audience's mind run, all the things that you can imagine that could happen to a 12-year-old kid with a bunch of uh, oh. other men. That's what happened to me. And... Uh, I'll just be very transparent with you because at 45 years old, I've actually just began to deal with this stuff. Yeah, I talk about it in in a, in a 10,000 foot level when I'm speaking to an audience. Right. But man, it, I've realized that I've had to get some things dealt with in my life mm-hmm. that I've been carrying around for the past 40 plus years. So I just can't believe that you endured all of that I mean, you know, it makes me just want to go back in time and just take that little boy and say, I'll take care of you. Yeah, I must, I must say that there, there was a lady, it was my stepdad's sister Mm -hmm. and she's still in my life to this day. We were connected after about 30 years. She did come and get us every now and then and give us a reprieve, like take us to the movies and get us out of that environment Mm -hmm. because she knew the environment was treacherous. Her name is Susie and she's an amazing woman. I still love that lady to this day. Um, but after the group homes, which were, which were pretty traumatic, I was placed in the first or the second, I guess, of foster homes when I was about 12 and a half, 13 years old. Okay. And that was a, that was a good place, but circumstances necessitated that I had to move. So I wound up moving to a second or third foster home by this time Jeez. with with Ruth E. Plowden. Ruth E. Plowden. She was, Cheryl, uh, she was the lady who drew me out of the Nile River. 
I saw that. Um, I saw her name on your website. So you certainly pay homage to her, give her the credit um, for helping to change your life. She did. She uh, she had 83 foster kids over 30 plus years. God bless so, her. So I know I was her favorite, of course. Oh, of but course. Uh, I was able to give the eulogy at, at Ruth E. Plowden's uh, funeral. This is how much of an impact I think we had in each other's life. And Ruth told me, mom to me, but she told me, she said, Chris, you can take all of that. Cause she knew my story. You know, she had foster kids. She took her and pops took in the, if you will, the hardest of the hard, you know, the abusers, the abuse, the sex offenders. She took them all in. She didn't reject anybody. And she took me in and she said, you can take all of that, Chris, and use it as an excuse for why you can't succeed or you can use it to change the world. So I began to take advantage of that. She got me plugged into a church right up the street. Church had about 2,500 members. And uh, I, I gravitated to that, man. I got involved in theater and singing and acting. And it really just, it just went from staying in a garage and sweeping up roaches to finally someone that could just cultivate what was already in me. And uh, the folks at church on the North Coast, Pastor Lewis and Tina Kayaton, those folks uh, gave me my actual first job. They hired me to work at the church. And what I did was I helped create a program called Joshua Kids. Mm -hmm. And we went into the inner city of Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, ministered to young project kids like me. And we would bust them into the church every Saturday. Over 300 kids uh, were in that program. And many of them are adults now in that church. And so that, that's where things really began to shift is when I was able to get with uh, mom and pops. Blouding. Now, how old were you when you were given that job in the church? Uh, let me see here. 16. Okay. And okay. then uh, and when I turned 18 and got out of uh, high school, uh, I, I worked there full time mm -hmm. and that was my full time job. And, and uh, they set me up in an apartment. And then uh, that year of graduation, I helped lead a missions team over in Belden, England and Yorkshire. We traveled all over to schools and, 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 and inspired young people, thousands of young people. I did this at 18 years old and it was just an absolutely uh, 360 from, from the life that, that started with me. So I just have got to ask, did you sometimes want to either pinch yourself or think, how is this happening to me? Or when you realized where you had been and then just a few years later, you became, you know, this incredible, had these incredible opportunities and you were actually mentoring and counseling and encouraging people, young people who had been in the same situation that you had been in. How did that feel? Man, you know what? It, I I will be honest with you. Outside of my obviously, you you got to have this order: God, my my wife, and then my kids. Outside of that, uh, those experiences are truly the hallmarks of my life. Like in other words, I wouldn't rather do anything outside of those areas that I mentioned, mm -hmm. so I don't get in trouble. <laughs> I wouldn't rather do anything than to be in the incubator of someone's mind who feels like they can't make it. And I can tell them, hey, listen, no matter what adversity comes your way, Cheryl, you still can make it. I, I equate my life to the sea turtle. I feel as if I am the sea turtle. And I use that in many of my speeches, which you can hear anywhere at clkingspeaker.com. Listen, I, I say that the sea turtle was born in adversity. Every obstacle and every statistic, every metric is stacked against the sea turtle. Mm -hmm. And yet there's that 1% that says, I've seen people fall. I've seen other turtles get scooped up. I've seen them get caught in, in webbing in the sea. I've seen them fail. And yet uh, my job is to keep swimming. And that's what I try to tell people, Cheryl. I know my blood pressure getting raised right now. But this is what I try to tell people, man. <laughs> That no matter what adversity comes your way, I should be a living testimony to you that if you just keep your focus and you keep swimming, you can still make it. That is wonderful. I want to break out into applause. But I have to tell you, I'm sure that your blood pressure has elevated a little bit. But hey, uh, OK, I'm, I'm a medical professional. I think it's probably doing it in a healthy way. Yes, ma'am. 
<laughs> it's just, yeah, and we call it energy, I guess, in, you know, like Japanese or whatever martial arts, we'd call it chi, that your chi is just rising. My so, chi, and your, yeah, I got the your chi, chi going on. <laughs> and your spirit, because that's what it is. It's you truly have the mind and, and the spirit of a warrior. And again, warrior does not mean something bad like fighting or whatever. It's right. just the spirit of a warrior has a very compassionate heart and a heart of gratitude and really wants to help look out for other people. They want to take care of themselves, their families, their communities, and to try and right what they see that is wrong. Right. I, I just can't believe at such a young age with everything that you had been through that you were able just to turn that around and take all of that and make it something, you know, I don't want to say positive, but you came through the, 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 dark times and into the light. And now you share that light with everybody you come across. I can tell you this, Cheryl, and, and, and these opportunities, I, I do not take them for granted that you mm -hmm. would even share your, your illustrious platform with, with someone like me. I don't take it for granted. I mean, I've been paid tens of thousands of dollars to speak, so I don't mind doing that, but I never take it for granted, Cheryl. Let, let, let me, let me lay this out for you. Mm -hmm. Um, one, one of the things that I realize is that I have a purpose in life and all of those dispensations, all of those checkpoints were all a part of the process. And it's my story, just like your story. I can't live your story. I can't live vicariously. I couldn't be a ninja if I wanted to be because it's, it's, it's your story. And oftentimes, I remember when I first started speaking professionally, they expect you to be this certain way, right? You know, mm -hmm. you're supposed to be like Zig Ziglar and you're supposed to be all suave and everything. And I, I got my veins popping out my neck and I'm <laughs> jumping off the stage and sweats flying everywhere. And I'm, I'm just like, man, you know what I mean? I'm just, you know why? Because that's the way I was forged. I was uh -huh. forged in the grind. I was not forged in, in the soft marshmallowy dispensations of suburbia. I was, I was forged in the grind. And so what, what I feel like is, is that, I am, that's my venue. That's my lane for this time. I used to give out surveys at my speeches. I don't give them out anymore mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I used to give surveys as teachers and they'd be like, well, he was too loud. He was, I'm just like, really? I came and ate your cheap fried chicken at your school. And that's the only <laughs> thing you can say is I was too loud. But, but you got to realize something, Cheryl. I just did a Zoom a couple of weeks ago for some high school students and the students were crying. Guess why? Because some of them had the same story mm -hmm. as me mm -hmm. and woe be it unto me to, to, to tell someone, man, listen, it was hard. It was adverse, but let me tell you, I made it and, mm -hmm. and, and I want you to make it. And I get, and not just that, because I think sometimes motivational speakers get a, get a bad rap is just, well, it's just flash in the pan motivation, man. I've, I've give people the steps and tools and mm -hmm. the rudiments of how to mm -hmm. do it. That's important too. Well, I have to tell you as um, an audience participant who has sat through many speeches and stuff, I would much rather have somebody yelling and jumping up and down and sweat <laughs> flying off the stage. I don't even care if it hits me. I know I'm a fussy girl, but I can handle it because that shows passion. That yes, shows that, you know, you are really not only you know, engaged in your own story, you really want to share with them and to make that that impact, just like you say, impacting life. You know, if you were kind of refined and talking to people like that, to me, that's almost insulting. It's almost like someone is talking down to me and they're mm. not being real. They're not being relatable. And life is ugly sometimes. Man, I, always, is, try, I always try to start out that way. Ladies and gentlemen, C.L. King. Yes, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. And then probably about the first two minutes, I black out. I don't remember what else happens. <laughs> I say, listen, I can't. I, I apologize to the folks who invited me here. Uh, you know what I mean? They just, <laughs> please don't hold it against them. But here's what I got to tell you. And no, you're right. And, and I think uh, the life that we're living in, people are craving authentic. Mm -hmm. And people are craving genuine and, you know, I, I just feel like this is my, this is my John the Baptist journey. My, my mm -hmm. purpose is to stir people up. Even sometimes it provokes them to anger, 
not on intentionally want to make people mad, but it's like, I got to self-reflect. You're sitting at home whining and complaining and belly aching about how bad the world is when you have all these tools at your disposal. No, you got to start, get up, dust mm-hmm. yourself off and let's look forward to the future. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Everybody needs that come to Jesus kind of talk every now and again, right? <laughs> that's why they bring, they don't bring me, they don't bring me every week, but they bring me a couple times a year. <laughs> well, that's it. And that was the other point I wanted to make is you keep getting booked. So obviously you're doing something right. Yes, ma'am. You are so, yeah, you're, you really truly are such an inspiration. So I, one of the other things I wanted to ask you is when do you ever sleep? Because with all of the things you do, you are incredibly busy. Yes. You know, I, I have found, uh, my pastor told me this and, uh, cause sometimes I do complain about being overextended. He said, well, you can sleep when you get to heaven. I said, okay, I don't know if they sleep up there. Um, <laughs> But here's here's what I here's what I've discovered, Cheryl, and I'll just be honest with you. We have woven into our lives, our lives. So speaking is not just something that I do; it's who I am. But it's a part, like my son's drums. Mm-hmm. I'm not a drummer anymore, but it's a part of all of our lives, and our our unique individual identities. Uh, it doesn't take away from the family dynamic. We make time for all the things. I mean, we, we had seven kids, so we obviously made time for some things, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but it is an understanding. This is a different dispensation in my life where when they were younger, obviously, I mean, I started my speaking business in 2009, 2010. Um, but as things started taking off, I really, tried to make it important that this was still a part of our family life. So staying up till two or three o'clock in the morning is just the norm for us. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? It's a part of our makeup. Now, everybody's approach is different. Some people will need eight hours of sleep and, and all of those things. And I probably should ascribe to that some myself, but I just find that the grind for me is what fuels me. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? The grind is like the G is, is like generate. That's what my mm-hmm. grind training, the G stands for generate. It's re- our responsibility, Cheryl, to generate that, 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 that spark. And so, uh, yeah, we, we sleep when we get tired and that's it. <laughs> so you do have several programs. You have the grind program. You also yeah. have your gear training yeah, and you also have the goal and if initiative, which again, brings me back to, well, that's why you don't sleep. You have a very fertile mind. Um, so tell us about some of those things, some of those, um, programs that you have. Well, you know, I love, I love all three of them. Uh, and I'll just start with maybe I'll try to be succinct because I know podcast listeners listen a certain way. Mm-hmm. So I have to remember that I'm not, I can't just go on rambling. So I got to get, make it succinct. The goal initiative helps students identify their top five career goals. <clears throat> and what we do, what our company does is we network with other entities, agencies like beauty salons, financial people, barbershops, colleges, all that. And we get these kids exposure to their goals. So we make them identify their top five. We make them write an essay about each goal. We make them analyze what it takes to get into that career path. And then we bring those people to them. Oh, How cool nice. is that? How cool is that for you to say, I, there was one student, uh, one of our, our valedictorians out of the goal initiative. She wanted to be a, um, she wanted to work in cosmetology. Guess what that young lady's doing to this day? Working cosmetology. in cosmetology. Mm-hmm. Cosmetology, because she got exposed to, in ninth grade, our program, she got exposed to, man, it ain't just about weaving in braids, honey child. No, no, no. It's a whole lot more than that. There's chemicals, there's chemistry, there's all kind of stuff in cosmetology and barbering. And so when we got them exposure, we made partnerships with several community colleges. And when we got them exposures, my goodness, they were like, I want to do that. Mm-hmm. I remember the first time I saw like, uh, you know, how to do public speaking. I said, that is what I'm going to do right there. And, I and, wondered how you got into public speaking. Yeah. At church on the North coast, they let me, you know what I'm saying? And, and I know that's on a, from a religious perspective, but being able to see the results of you talking to a group of kids 
that that really have no hope and 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 inspiring them and then at the end them all coming up and hugging on you oh. and, and wanting to hang out with you that right there is I- irreplaceable man and so yeah the goal initiative is the top five career goals the the gear training which we just launched uh, and refined I should say relaunched in um, the be- the uh, beginning of or I can't even remember what year it is anymore. It wasn't this year. Maybe it was last year. That's okay. 2020 is worth forgetting. You know what I'm saying? So gear is an acronym and most things that we do is an acronym. Goal is getting others active or getting ourselves active in leadership. Gear is um, the G stands for identifying your giftings. The E stands for the energy and endurance required to use those gifts. The A deals with activating because a lot of times we do all this stuff and we don't ever act on it. And then the, the R in gear is understanding the energy and results. And we teach people, young people, students, college, educators, whoever, that gifts are important. You know what I teach them, uh, Cheryl? And I sometimes get in trouble for this, but I do it anyway. <laughs> Putting those fries in the basket of oil at Mickey D's is not a gift. Mm-hmm. That's work. Mm-hmm. That's labor. Mm-hmm. That is not a gift. You could train anybody to do that. You could train C.L. King to come in there, fries, push the button, take them out, serve. That mm-hmm. is not a gift. But there's things inside of us that were given to us. Some of some people think, well, it cannot, is it is it physical? No, man, it might be, it might be your your compassion for people. Uh, therapy might be your gift. But the problem is, is that we we plug people into the stuff they have to do to put food on their table instead of the stuff that they're gifted to do that they will love for the rest of your life. You know, I never have to tell Chris to quit drumming. Never. Mm. Yes, I do. Because he's always making noise. Mm-hmm. But I never have to I, I never have to go in there and tell him to drum. I said that wrong. Yeah. I never have to tell Chris, boy, get in there and practice because yeah. that brother it practices on his practice pad 24 seven. Why? Because it's his gift. Mm-hmm. Now, what's that gift getting ready to do for him? If he makes it past the audition and doesn't fail in boot camp, that brother's getting ready to put food on his table via a gift that was given to him when he was two years old. Jesus have mercy. And so, <laughs> <laughs> and so that's what the G E A R stands for. And the last is grind. That's more of a leadership training. We, we work with corporations and institutions to help them understand what, what the G and the G and grind is generate. I'm not going to give all the, the things out for that because then people won't want to do the training, <laughs> but each acronym talks about the R is really good. And I'll, I'll share that with you. G R I N D the R is have you developed a resistance to Ooh. resistance? Oh, that's good. Think about that. Have you developed a resistance to resistance, Cheryl? Do you know how many people told CL King? No, we don't want you to come speak. That was resistance. And you know what I started doing? I said, okay, Please, God bless you. Thank you. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Now those people pay me to come talk for 20 minutes because I didn't allow their no or their resistance to, 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 na- to help me navigate. I said, you know what? I'm going to develop a resistance to negativity. Mm-hmm. I'm going to mm-hmm. develop a resistance to resistance. And when people can do that and not be so moved by what people post on social media or what people put in Instagram or how many people like what you do, I don't care if nobody likes what I do. I know what my mission is. And mm-hmm. so I continue, man. So there you go. That's the training that we give, Woo. the grind training, the gear and the goal initiative. Okay, so I know right now I've got half of the listening audience is going, how do I sign up for this? How do I find this person? Well, it's very, very simple. We offer these trainings in the virtual world too. We had to pivot, Cheryl, just like I'm sure many people did. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why I said I was. I do a lot of work now through our virtual platform, which has mm-hmm. really been an amazing transition for us. I actually was like, man, we should have did this a long time ago, to be yeah. honest with you. Uh, so all they got to do is go to clkingspeaker.com. Okay. And uh, there's an opportunity for them to connect with us, send us a bit of little information, a contact form, and we'll get back with them and we can brainstorm the possibilities of a CL King event with them. CLKingSpeaker.com. Did I get yes, it right? C- you got it right. CLKingSpeaker.com. And we, we can set up all, we can set up a meeting, a, a virtual meeting, and, and we can just go from there. That's what we love to do for your school, for your church, for your community center, for, for your organization. We deal with organizational leadership. Cheryl, you got to help me. You got to motivate me. Okay. You're writing a book. I, I, you're, you're working on your second book. 
I'm trying to yeah. get my first book done. Oh, I will be your accountability partner. I need it because I've had this book in my spirit since 2016. You know the title of it? What? The Edge of the Huddle. Oh, I like that. Now, did you play sports? No, I mean, it has, was... guess what? It has absolutely nothing to do with sports. Ooh. It has everything to do with the 80-20 rule. You know, the Pareto principle, you get, uh -huh. you, you only get 20% of the folks who do 80% of the work, right? And I've studied that amongst organizations like churches and nonprofits and stuff. They're uh -huh. always struggling trying to get more people, right? Right. Go look at Antarctica and the emperor penguins. Every time the mother leaves them with the egg, they form a huddle mm -hmm. and every one of those penguins takes a turn on the outside edge of the huddle it's 30 degrees warmer in the center mm -hmm. but everyone recognizes that it's their job not to sustain their one little egg because that's a part of the process but the bigger part of the process is the whole mm -hmm. see if organizations would teach cultural uh uh, engagement like that instead of it all being about the individual emperor penguins don't form a nest do they they form a huddle so that's mm -hmm. that's gonna be the book oh i love that and i can't wait to read it so let me know as soon as it's out and you know hey if you ever need a pep talk if you ever need a little bit of encouragement if you ever need somebody to kind of read something for you or do a little quick edit i'm your girl uh, that's what I see. We already got you. This is recorded. So we got you now. I'm gonna go back and edit this part and keep that and play it on a loop for you. <laughs> Let's see. Keep forgetting I record these things. Okay. So there's another part of you that I just want the listening audience to get get to know a little bit more too, because I think it's so special. It's so sweet. Um, because you know, you're this great big guy, and you're just so energetic. And, you know, you really are a softy. <laughs> and you had a, a big weekend or a big event come up and apparently you just cried all the way through it. Oh, you really going to do that to me? You, uh, uh, okay. I'm going to get you back for that one. <laughs> I know. I know. And it's being recorded. So everybody will remember that. Listen, man, I've got seven children. Each one of them have a very unique uh, posture in my wife and I's life. And mm -hmm. Chris, who I mentioned about the drummer. Um, this has been probably the most challenging year because he's the lead drummer at his school. He's the lead drum drummer at church and marching band. All of oh. the activities was canceled this yeah. year. This is supposed to be a senior year. They're supposed to go to Disney. This is just supposed to be the marquee year for him. And um, he, uh, December 28th, he turned, he turned uh, 18. And dad was... Um, I'm pretty nostalgic. I, I, Facebook memories really shouldn't be in my, <laughs> I sh, I, they should just do away with those because I just want to save everything. And uh, oh. I just was reflecting on his journey and uh, it really just broke my heart. And and you look at your kids, you all, Jeremiah just got his first deer. I cried like a baby oh. over that. You know what I mean? He, he just, he'd been hunting all winter, can't get nothing. And he makes his first deer and dad just turns into a big old baby, big tough Marine, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and so it, it's like that. And I, and I feel like if I could say anything relative to weaving all that together, mm -hmm. uh, I, I've been that way with all of my children. Uh, and I've tried to encourage them that it's okay. Like I sat Chris down in here the other day and I was trying to just tell him how proud I was of him and we're getting ready to go record and I could not get it. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't get it together, Sarah. I tried, but you know what? They are like oh, that too. Mm -hmm. that, and, and, and I like that, uh, especially if we're raising men, because mm. we're not raising boys, we're raising men. Right. And I want them always, I hug them, I kiss them. I, I want them to know that they're, they're loved and that's important. Uh, I didn't have that as a child until I got to, to Mrs. Plowden's house where they showed me affection, but I never got, I don't recall a hug from my dad. I don't recall. I don't mm -hmm. recall my biological dad. Mm -hmm. And so these boys, my son's six, four, Jeremiah's six, something, my other one's off in the army. My other one's up in Cleveland, man, when oh, I'm wow. around them, when I'm up around them, dad is hugging on you. Just get used to it because mm -hmm. those are the things I longed for. And that's why I feel like our relationship is the way it is today. You know, I just know, what is her name? Mrs. Powell? Miss Plowden. Miss Plowden. I know she mm -hmm. is looking down on you and smiling and just 
loving what you're doing, not only with your family, your kids, uh, you know, but with life in general and impacting life the way you do one day at a time, one person at a time, impacting life 24 seven, which is another thing. Just mention you have this wonderful podcast and you are such a brave man because you do yours live on Facebook. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's quite, that's, that was a challenge. Uh, 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 probably uh, out of 115 episodes, I would say 75% of them were a train wreck. <laughs> <laughs> but you kept going. Yes. And, and I would encourage anyone that's looking to do something like that. Don't quit until you've done it a hundred times. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And, and when I made it past episode 100, of course, I brought some people along with me to help me. But I started realizing, okay, this is what we need to do. So this is not so stressful. And, and, and now uh, we're the next hundred episodes, we learned a lot. And, but here's why we created it. Not for another place for me to ramble and speak, because I can do that anywhere. But I wanted to create a platform for others that we could magnify the work like people like you, someone who was 47 years old, that was a ballerina that her, had her hair in a bun and had to go into a <laughs> testosterone filled room with a bunch of yeah. men and, and navigate that to become the first ever black belt ninja of her sensei. Let me tell you something. That is a story. I want America and the world to hear because that is impact. You see, we always think, well, is it what I do? Sometimes it's just a story. We're open epistles read of all men, Cheryl, and your story has impacted people that we will, we might never know. We, well, somebody might be out there now with their little, what's the costume y'all wear, the karate thing? A yeah, gi. That, yeah, the gi. They might be out there right now at their first lesson in their gi because they heard a lady challenge them that even at 47, you started that journey and you made it to black belt. That's what it's about. That's right. That's right. Well, let me see. What else could I ask you? I think (laughs) I am just, I think I'm, I'm, once again, I'm overwhelmed. And once we sign off, I'm just going to be running around the house, going out in the yard in the snow, by the way, it did snow. I told you a big fat lie when I talked to you and said that, oh, it's always beautiful, even though we can get two feet of snow or whatever, the sun yeah. comes out and go out. There. Well, that didn't quite work that way this time. It got real cold. We only got two inches. Haven't seen the sun in a while, but uh, the sun will come out tomorrow. So you didn't get two feet because I was going to tell you to send me a picture of that. But if you just got two inches, I ain't interested in that. I want to see the the dynamics of the snowstorm. When I get, when we get a big one, I'm going to, I'll do a video or whatever, send it to you. Uh, yeah, pictures. Oh yeah. You'll get to see it. Y'all didn't have a white Christmas. No, we did not. No. It was 57 degrees. Yeah. It was like almost 70 here the day, the yeah. day before Christmas here in, in Eastern North Carolina. So listen, I, I listen, Cheryl, I just really, really, really mean this when I say uh, collaboration and partnership and, and I, I want to, At every interval that you feel or that we feel that we need to inject some impact into the lives of of another audience, because, you know, our audiences are fluid. Mm -hmm. Um, I I just want us to be, man, I'm just considering you a regular on our show and and a part and a part of our organization. Okay. Thank you. Well, back at you. I can't wait to have you again. This has been so much fun. You were so awesome. I could sit here and talk to you for the rest of the day, but that probably isn't practical. And I just want to thank you so much for coming on the show, sharing your voice, sharing your story. And I know you have impacted a lot of people just on this one podcast. And I'm so honored to be you know, part of that journey with you. So to my audience, I just want to remind you to check out CL's website. Go to clkingspeaker.com. Check out all of his programs. I was looking at them over the past couple of days and I wanna sign up for all of them myself. And do check out his podcast, uh, Impacting Life 24 seven. It is on all of the platforms, correct? Mm-hmm. Sure is. You can As, go there. You can go to any platform, iTunes, Spotify, or you can go to impactinglife247.podbean.com. That's our host platform, mm-hmm. but you can link it to our website. Our website's linked to our podcast. So that's clkingspeaker.com. It's easy. Okay. And you're even on Pandora. Yeah, we just we just negotiated a big multi-million dollar deal. Uh, except <laughs> they ain't pay me, they ain't pay me no money to be on there. <laughs> 
it's like they're they're giving me a little 10 by 10 space at a craft show so we just going to kind of work that audience they got about 53 million listeners so we're going to try to continue to 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 expand there that's great well once again cl thank you for being here i do so appreciate you and i'm so glad that we connected it was meant to be yes ma'am it surely was it's been my honor Oh, thank you. And thank you for listening. Make sure you check out uh, CL's website, his podcast. The man, as you can tell, is absolutely amazing. And remember, no matter what you're going through, you can get through it. Just stay positive and life is worth squeezing everything out of it that we can. Amen. And that's right. That's right. That is the way of the femininja. And that's a wrap on another episode of the Femininja Project. Thank you so much for listening. And remember, be safe, be strong. And until next time, bye now.